Good morning. I'm Jamie from Stonemeyer Games, and I'm here today on April 17th to join you for the next hour. Hopefully the next hour. We're a little under the weather here in our house this week, um, uh, but I think I should be fine for the next hour. Thank you so much for being here. As usual, I am here to share some Stonemeyer Games news. I don't think I have much news today. Um, answer your questions if you have any questions about non-spoiler stuff and just to uh, talk about some random topics. So yeah, thank you. I see a bunch of people are already in the comments here. So it's wonderful to see some old and new names. You're always welcome to comment. If you never commented before, it's fine to do that. It's also fine to stay silent and just watch and hang out in the background, whether you're watching this live or in the future on YouTube or Facebook. Uh, let me make sure I cover at least the topics that are in the title of today's video. Kansas City, I mentioned Kansas City. We, Megan's family is from Kansas City. And her brother lives in St. Louis with his wife. And so we all drove with their dogs to Kansas City this past weekend to visit uh, Megan's parents for her mama's birthday. And we had a wonderful little stay there. We had some good food. We played disc golf a couple days in a row. And amazingly, I got my third disc golf ace, uh, which is just like a ball golf ace where when you throw the disc off the, off the tee, it actually goes in the basket with one shot. I've had that happen twice before, but this was particularly a surprise because I've only played on this course, this course called Waterworks in, in Kansas City, one other time, and I was throwing backhand. I haven't thrown backhand drives in two years now. I've only thrown forehand drives. Backhand is like this, forehand is like this, uh, but my elbow has been bothering me, so I, I was throwing backhand this weekend. So it was a massive surprise that I actually threw a, a, a disc golf in the basket off the drive like that. Really, really nice. Uh, shot or lucky shot. I would say lucky shot. It, it was it was uh, not something I had been practicing basically for the last two years. Um, we also played in Kansas City. We played only a few games. We we played Blob Party and we played Ito, two uh, party style games that I really really enjoy. I enjoy both those games. Uh, Chad is asking about the shirt. He says, "What's it from?" Uh, this is Kenergy. So this is a reference to the Barbie movie. Um, someone who is linked to Stillmeyer Games works for Warner Brothers, and um, Barbie was like their, you know, their their huge movie last year. And he gave me this shirt very kindly when he was in St. Louis for Design Day. Tim reminded me to show the questions. Thank you, Tim. Oh, that might be the earliest question catch already. Here is I'll put Chad's comment up there to get myself in the habit of doing that. Um, and, uh, oh, Chad hasn't seen the Barbie movie yet. Oh, I, I'd highly recommend the Barbie movie. I'm looking forward to rewatching it. In fact, I, I was in thinking about rewatching the Barbie movie the other day on my personal blog, I posted the topic of what do you think is the most rewatchable movie? So maybe for, I guess, somewhat context, think of the movies that you've watched more than once and think of which of those movies you could definitely see yourself or others watching even more in the future. Um, some, let's see some of the movies that I mentioned, I'll pull up my list real quick. The most rewatchable movie. So my list was the prestige, the Incredibles fight club, star Wars. I listed specifically episode five, episode seven and rogue one. There's something about Mary groundhog day, the matrix Thor Ragnarok, the Avengers infinity war, part one, iron man, galaxy quest, the fellowship of the ring, and definitely maybe list a little bit all over the place, but those are the movies that I've watched more than once and really, really enjoyed more than once uh, and could see myself also watching again. Um, uh, and Garrett mentioned, so on this topic, Garrett mentioned this as well. He says, uh, check out the Rewatchables podcast. It's a lot of fun to hear them chat about this topic. Yes, thank you for the recommendation, Garrett. I need to pull that up on Spotify uh, so that I remember to do that. So let's see, Spotify rewatchables there we go thank you for that recommendation super keener says will stillmeyer be represented at the U uk games expo um my co-worker alex will be there primarily for meetings um alex has a lot of meetings with uh distributors localization partners um logistics partners things like that uh but Still Modern Games will have a presence through our European distributor, Asmodee. So at Asmodee will have a big booth there. And we have uh, recently, I sent out a note to Still Modern ambassadors to say that they could sign up to teach and demo our games at the, uh, the, the 
Asmodee UK booth. So we'll have a presence there through some Stillmeyer ambassadors and somewhat through Alex, uh, very officially through Alex, but I think Alex uh, will have a lot, of him, a lot of his time will be in meetings, not just wandering around. But if you do see Alex and you know what Alex looks like, he's, there's a photo of him on our website, feel free to say hi. Um, and and all, of course, if you wanna learn one of our games, feel free to stop by the Asmodee uh, UK booth to, uh, to learn some. Chad says he just recently reorganized the placement of his desk and furniture in his home office. The sun in his eyes was too much. Getting used to the change now. Ever consider rearranging your home office? You know, I, I, there's something really satisfying whenever I rearrange a space. Um, and I've considered doing that in this office many times. What you, I guess you can't see, I don't want to mess up the camera, so I won't move the camera, but what you can't see right now is, so there's this, well, you can see this. So I'm on the, the third floor of a building, the top floor. And this thing poses some problems. I, I can't hang anything on it. It, it kind of limits um, what I can put up against this wall. Uh, I, I have a little red rising photo back here, but that's pretty much it. And then um, that cabinet doesn't move. And so that cabinet can't go anywhere. There's that window. I have a window right here off to the side. And then I have a fully flat wall over the, that you can't see right off camera on that corner of the room that has my calyx shelf on it. So I've thought about at times Really, I mean, really, the ideal place for the desk would be right here behind me because of lighting. Um, but that isn't the, it, it just doesn't work because of that, this slanted ceiling. So I thought about it. I thought about rearranging things in here, but I uh, haven't done it. So hopefully the, your adjustment works well for you. Nate says he's seen, he's seen Dune 2 and he definitely sees himself watching it many more times. Just a total thrilling experience. Uh, I absolutely agree with that. I, I've only seen it once so far, but I, I really enjoyed the first watch. And I, I mentioned in the, in the the other one of the other topics I mentioned today is title card is Team Dune. And what I was referring to is that last Wednesday, I was uh, planning on playing Dune Imperium Uprising with three other people at game night, but we had six people instead. And so we decided to jump in and try the team version of it, the team mode in Dune Imperium Uprising, which was really cool it was a, a i would say bigger than we expected it to be um the the idea in the game is that there are two leaders there's two teams each team has a leader and uh and then two other players on the team and, and those players are are fully doing what you would always do and do in imperium but they're doing so kind of looking out for what their teammates are also doing uh I'm not describing it very well, but it, it just it, it took a little bit more for us to under, understand it than we thought it would be. Uh, but we had a lot of fun. It was a really, really epic game. And one of the key differences is uh, the game is triggered the same way as a normal game of Dune Imperium, where uh, uh, any player reaches 10 victory points. But your final score is the sum of all of your teammates scores. So your team score is the, the, the sum of three different players scores. And our final score was 30 to 29. It was one point off. So every little move in that game mattered, made a huge difference, um, or, or potentially had an impact on the, the final outcome of the game. Really, really fun play of Dune Imperium Uprising, the team mode with a full six players. The only downside is that it took three and a half hours, maybe without the teach, because we were kind of learning that that team variant as we, as we went, maybe without that, uh, it could have taken down to three hours, but still it's a little bit longer than what I'm typically looking for in a board game. Whereas I can play Dune Imperium in about two hours with anybody, with people who know how to play it. So really, really neat experience. I'm glad we played it at least once. Wow. Corey says he watched uh, Pulp Fiction 12 times in the theater. Um, and, and most of those times he was sharing it with someone else. I have not seen many movies... I'm trying to think if I've seen any movie three times in the theater. I can only think of really one, and it's a Kind of a juvenile comedy, but when I was in high school, maybe college, I saw There's Something About Mary. That's why it's on my list. I saw that three times in the theater. And I I think maybe I just hadn't seen that type of humor before. And I thought it was the funniest thing I'd ever seen. I kind of want to go back and rewatch it as an adult to see if I still find it as funny as I did back then. But I, yeah, it, it uh, that, that movie delighted me. Very different genre than Pulp Fiction. Dawson mentions Napoleon Dynamite and Hap and Hot Fuzz. 
I see earlier, uh, Nate mentions The Prestige and The Illusionist, and now you see me, a lot of uh, magic-themed movies. David says uh, The Black Hole and Hawk the Slayer. I'm not familiar with either of those movies. Um, so I'm trying to get uh, the reference here for Garrett. He says, that scoring somewhat reminds... Oh, the scoring for uh, Dune Imperium. Somewhat reminds me of the between two idea where you can't just rush with one player. You need to lift up your play neighbors to succeed. That's exactly what it felt like, Garrett. Yeah, I mean, and at, at a certain point in the game, we were just all trying to get points, but we were trying to get points in ways that we weren't getting in the way of our opponents, especially with the influence tracks and with combat, where we were trying to, or not the opponents, of our teammates. We wanted our teammates to shine in those circumstances and not uh, not jockey for the same victory points, basically. Edward says, will there be an apiary expansion? Let's see. You know, I'll pull up our uh, our progress chart over here. Let's see what our progress chart says about that, Edward. Um, let me share my other screen here. All right, here's my other screen. So if you go to the news page on our website, news, and you scroll down here, you can look to see what we're working on. So right here, yeah, we have apiary expansion right there. No, no date yet for it, but just a project that we are currently working on, apiary expansion. Yeah. So we are actively working on that. That's uh, this is on our website at all times. And you can also go down and see our archived e-newsletters if you're curious to see different things that we've announced, announced or highlighted in recent newsletters. Ian says that he just started playing Rolling Realms and he loves my videos. Thanks for the game and the videos. Thank you so much for playing. I really appreciate that, Ian. Uh, it's been one of the great unexpected joys of my gaming career um, I, to uh, to have Rolling Realms become what it became. It, you know, just a series of uh, unexpected things happened with that game, where it, it started off as just a fun print and play game that I created during the pandemic to connect with other people when we were isolating early on in, in the pandemic, and then it became a published game, and then it, uh, it, it we added realms inspired by non stolmeyer games, and then I, I started doing the live streaming, and uh, yeah, it just uh, it's it's yeah, I'm so I'm so happy that you're enjoying it. it. It's meant a lot to me. It meant it's meant more to me than than I ever expected to come from uh, a game like Rolling Realms, kind of a lighter game that you're essentially playing solo, but it's fun to play with other people, whether virtually or in person. Yeah. Jean-Pierre says the Arthur Clarke trilogy Rama is foreseen to be directed by uh, Villeneuve. Is that how you say it? Also, there was a, so that's the same director as uh, the Doom movies. There was a PC adventure game from, from Sierra 20 years ago. They'd be worth to investigate the way to make a board game with it too. Interesting. That's a good tip about the future. I think I read at least one of the Rama books and uh, yeah. It, it's it's been a while, but I'm pretty sure when I was a, in, in maybe a teenager, I read those books, a couple of them. Well, Garrett says he has a birthday coming up, and he might try Dune Imperium with six players on his birthday. Definitely epic, Garrett. If you have time, I think it's worth trying once. It was a, a really really epic experience. Um, yeah, yeah, we we enjoyed it. Ray says, do you play any other outdoor yard games aside from disc golf, like cube, cornhole, etc.? I have played cube. At my family reunions, we play a lot of ladder golf, uh, which is where you have a, a kind of a plastic ladder-like thing that you're throwing um, two golf balls that are attached by a string. You're throwing that and trying to loop it around the ladder. We play a lot of that at my family reunions on the beach and really enjoyed that. As for other outside activities, I when I travel, I do like to go on hikes, but now that I have disc golf, which is like hiking with a with a game attached to it, I, I like to find disc golf courses if possible. Um, I, I've played soccer my entire life, or I played soccer my entire life. I haven't played in a few years now, but I played a lot of soccer growing up. I also love to play ultimate frisbee. I played a lot of that growing up. Um, and in uh, college, I played intramural basketball. We had a basketball up or a small basketball court at my home growing up. So I played a lot of basketball there and uh, a lot of intramural football as well. So, uh, but my main outdoor sport now is, is disc golf. Jeremy says, have I watched the video by Tabletop Taki, Toki? This needs to stop talking about wasteful packaging. I appreciate you do, you're doing your best 
finding eco-friendly solutions at Snowmeyer. I haven't uh, I haven't watched that particular video, but let me pull it up so I don't forget it. Tabletop Taki. Okay. This uh, I don't know this person, but um, I, I recognize their content. Uh, I will check it out. This needs to stop. Let's see where it. I see. Kind of a clickbaity title, but uh, I'll check it out. Yeah. Um, so let's see if I can get a rough idea. No, I can't tell from just uh, skimming through it what what uh, she's referring to. Um, but yeah, I'm curious. I'm curious about it. And yeah, we are. We're always thinking about the the ecological impact of our, of our games. And and one of the things that we've tried to do in more recent years is if we, if we have an expansion that is designed to fit into the core box, which is generally what we try to do. We try to package the expansion in the most eco-friendly way possible. Um, and uh, it, I think you've probably seen this in recent years, and you'll continue to see this with future expansions coming out uh, as well. Uh, one of the challenges is it, with using just kind of plain corrugated cardboard for the expansion box is uh, if, there are com if there are components in there, it doesn't protect components as well basically as, as uh, other types of cardboard. So that's something we kind of keep in mind. Um, we have to deliver the product uh, so it, that it's, it's uh, protected and, and whole um, when, when you receive it. Um, so we're balancing that with, with eco-friendliness. But yeah, I'm, I'm curious. Thank you for the video. I'm always happy to learn from someone else's perspective about what they, uh, what they believe needs to stop in terms of wasteful packaging. I see George just arrived here. So the other topic I mentioned in the title today is Dungeon Crawler Carl. This is a book that some friends recommended to me about, uh, actually, I didn't know really much what it was about uh, other than the title, that it was probably about a dungeon, someone going on a dungeon crawl. And I've really been enjoying it. It's it's uh, it's essentially a video video game style dungeon crawl in book form, um, with the added element that it is this thing that is happening. I don't want to spoil anything, but this person is going on a, a very high stakes dungeon crawl, um, on in in the earth, in our world, but underground. It's being viewed by other creatures i won't i won't say who's who's watching it but so it ties kind of the voyeuristic element of uh like the hunger games to um to a dungeon crawl which is something that those of us who play games are probably familiar with so i am enjoying dungeon crawler carl as of this time i am curious if any of you have read um that uh that series or a series a similar series of books i think it's called like lit rpg a literary RPG is a, is a genre of fiction that I know not much about, but uh, I think this fits solidly into that genre. Um, other little topics that I didn't put on the title. I did post or recently. I, I, so we now have uh, kind of newsletters, not kind of newsletters. We have newsletters every that I send out every month or so about some of our brands. So we have one for the world of Wingspan, which covers Wingspan and Wormspan. We have one for Apiary. We have one for Scythe and Expeditions. And I sent the one for Wingspan and Wormspan last week uh, or a couple of days ago. Um, so that one is out there. In fact, I, as I'm talking about it, I realized that I, I try to post those newsletters on our um, on the main pages of the corresponding games on our website so that even if you don't subscribe or don't want to subscribe and you miss it, you can always go there afterward and pick up and, and just read the newsletter. So I, I forgot to, to do that. So I will just definitely do that. Jessica says that she, um, oh, she okay, she, she knows Dungeon Crawler Carl, Carl as well. She says it gets better with every book in the series. Oh, that's that's good to know. Yeah, I, I that's I'm already enjoying it. So I'm curious to see where it goes from here. And that's great to hear that it gets even better. Um, that's great. Uh, Tim is talking about movies that he's seen countless times. He says Star Wars Episode Four. I I, I used to watch Four a lot when I was younger. Um, now I enjoy Five. I think Five is maybe one of my favorite, if not my favorite, Star Wars movie. Brian is joining us today too. Brian is uh, someone who helps out with our accessibility proofreading, especially vision-friendly proofreading for our games. He's been very helpful with that. 
What else is going on? My video this past weekend, my Sunday long form top 10 Sunday video was about games that feature face down cards. So, so times where you play cards, some cards face up, but you play other cards face down and what that means for the games. It can mean a different, many different things based on the games. Um, but, and uh, yeah, that was a fun list to do. I loved being a little sneaky in games and choosing which cards to place face down when that is an option in a game. Some recent blogs I posted were, uh, I, I did one about the current state of play and win. So play and win is when a convention has a specific library library of games that isn't just for checkout, but rather the, the games that are in, in this library can be won at the end of the convention. So if you play one of those games, you can put your name in a, essentially a hat, maybe a virtual hat, a digital hat, or a real hat, and uh, a name is drawn from uh, the hat at the end of the convention, and you have a chance of winning that game that you played. Oftentimes a game that you learned and played because it was there in the play and win se section. Um, I've seen it worked very well at Geekway to the West where they have the caveat that if you win a game from play and win, you can't win another game. So you can win at most one. And that I think that discourages people from putting their names in the hat for games that they aren't interested in. They mainly only put their names in the hat for games that they actually want to win. I think it's a really, really cool system. And it's something that we support heavily in terms of marketing for Stonemaier games. We send a lot of our, our games to play and win conventions. So I, or conventions that have a play and win section. And so I talked about a blog post about that recently. And I also shared my publishing checklist. This is something I've been wanting to do for a while, but uh, I uh, finally put it together. So I use a, a massive checklist to manage my, all the different things that go into uh, uh, creating a new game or a new product at Stomire Games from start to finish. And I shared anything that kind of applies to the general public, I, th I think, not specific to Stomire in the post last Thursday. So if you're curious to see everything that goes into all the steps that go into at least what I do for publishing a game, my coworkers also do other things that aren't on that checklist. Check out Thursday's blog post. Uh, Jessica says she has many recommendations in the lit RPG genre. Feel free to share some other ones, Jessica, if you have any, any others that you really, really love. Um, I see, Carlos, I'll come back to your question in a second because I see one other question from Alvin about an RPG. Oh, I see. I'll, I'll just do these in order then. Carlos says, I've noticed that the Libertarian promo pack is ready and just waiting for launch and fulfillment. Is there a reason not to launch the product? Isn't it just costing money to just sit, to just sit on it? Carlos, that's a great question. Like, yeah, why would we have a product ready and not uh, not go ahead and launch it? A couple of reasons for that. Um, and one thing I can say is that it, very soon it's coming up that we will actually launch that product. But uh, part one reason is that we have four different fulfillment centers. So not everything arrives at every fulfillment center at the same time. Two, uh, we like to space out our launches. I don't, I don't want to feel like I'm constantly asking for your money. And so if we had just released a product a few weeks ago, I don't want to release another product a few weeks later. I want to space that out. And three, just in general, um, we try to time, especially for smaller products where we want to give you the opportunity to consolidate shipping with multiple products that we kind of need to wait for multiple products to be ready, not just one single product um, so that you can ship them together. So uh, that's sometimes why we hold products and actually four too. I, in general, I would much rather be ahead of schedule on a product um, than be rushing at the last minute. There are times where we get ahead of ourselves and we say, okay, this is the day that we want the launch date to be for this product. And then things happen along the way where maybe the production takes a little bit longer than normal. Maybe the freight shipping for one of the regions takes longer than normal. And suddenly it feels like we're rushing to make that product happen. I'd rather get ahead of schedule and just have something sitting in the, I'd rather have something in the warehouse for a month or so, so that we're not rushing to launch. So the fulfillment center can be ready to ship it. So a variety of reasons that, uh, that we we have there's a, there's reasons for why we determine when a uh, a product is actually ready for the launch, and a lot of it is looking out for you to make sure that, uh, like I said, that you can for like a tiny promo pack that you can ship it together with other things and not just that one thing. So, but I I'll cap this by saying again, it will happen very soon uh, that we actually launch this product. Alvin says, how would you define an RPG that Stelmeyer wouldn't accept a pitch of? More specifically, if someone was working on a worker placement engine builder designed to simulate in a massive multiplayer online RPG, would it just be dismissed? He's asking for a friend. Uh, so that's an interesting question. So we, we don't publish role-playing games, um, pen and paper role-playing games, like Dungeons and Dragons, you know, classic role-playing game. 
that is not something that uh, it's a whole different part of the hobby than than tabletop games. A lot of overlap in terms of who plays tabletop games versus RPGs, but very different game, very different way that you're you're creating the you know the RPG books and how you're selling them. And I don't I, I played very few RPGs, so I can't even I don't know what it, what a good RPG is versus a bad RPG. Now, if you have designed a game that has elements where players are building characters and using those characters for something, or they're going on adventures, or they're if you've designed a tabletop game with elements of an RPG, um, then it's uh, then that's that, that that's a tabletop game then. And so we we are open to considering any tabletop game. In fact, I there will be a point in the future I think where you see a game that we're currently working on that has very strong RPG elements. It's definitely not a role-playing game um, in, in terms of the traditional sense of, of Dungeons and Dragons being a role-playing game, but it uh, but it has elements of it. Yeah. David mentioned a game that I haven't played before. Blue Moon has a great bluff mechanism that allows you to play cards face down. That's cool. I haven't played Blue Moon. Julio, I, I, I'm going to post Julio's comment here, even though it's not a question, because I had the great pleasure of uh, recording a top 10 video with Julio yesterday. Julio is a Stillmeyer ambassador, and he asked me if I would uh, be open to fil filming a top 10 video with him. And we did a video yesterday about graphic design and user interface and product design in games, our favorite games that we think excel at those elements. So it was a great video. Julio, thank you so much for your time yesterday, and I look forward to posting that video when the time comes. Ray has a question about the Stillmeyer Champion program. Different, I just mentioned Julio is an ambassador. Ambassadors are people who sign up to, um, to kind of represent Stillmeyer games or to help out, uh, to proofread, to play test, to, to moderate, to teach games at conventions, things like that. Champions, it's a paid membership. It's an annual paid membership where you get 20% off everything that you buy from our web store for a year. Uh, if you pay a one-time fee of, I, I believe it's $15 currently. Ray's question is about Stillmeyer Champions, this paid membership program. He says, last year, an additional form of engagement was being able to vote on what products would go on sale each month. Is there a new form of addition, additional engagement planned for Champions this year? Ray, you know, I kind of came up with that thing on the fly and I ran with it for a year uh, just to see how it went. And I, I've i been trying to think of something like that uh, to do this year, but I haven't come up with anything yet. So if and when I do, I, I look forward to to trying it or experimenting with it to see how it goes. But I, I don't have anything planned, at least right now, is, was your question. Do I have anything planned that I don't? But I am hoping to try something. Um, and you reminded me of something about that in asking that. Oh, yeah. Sir, uh, okay. Dawson asks, has anyone played Wandering Towers? He says it's currently his go-to for family games and introducing people to, to gaming. I think it's a great a genius design and also very fun component factors. I have not played it, but I, the the photos I've seen of it look really cool. Susanna mentioned to me recently. This actually also got me on the topic of thinking of what movies are really rewatchable, re and she says that she's rewatched The Fifth Element twice this year after seeing it when it first came out. It's so unique and creative, plus a great story. And uh, Susanna mentioned that to me recently. We actually watched The Fifth Element again after Susanna mentioned it, and uh, yeah, it. it I think it holds up surprisingly well. Even the special effects uh, are, are pretty good for, for when it was filmed. Wendy also says she likes the fifth element. Uh, Carlos says, I understand the appeal of a box to hold the base game and expansions, but shouldn't this box be the expansions box rather than the base games box? Feels very restricted the other way around. Uh, yeah, Carlos, I, I understand where you're coming from there. And if, if costs weren't a factor, I, I totally agree. I think that would make perfect sense. But um, the box is a significant cost uh, to a game. Even just, pr so printing the box is a significant cost. Uh, a small box versus a big box can be double or triple the cost of the box. And that isn't taking into account the fulfillment cost and the freight shipping cost. So, Somewhere along the line, you need to have a box big enough to hold everything. Ideally, ideally, that's the goal. Um, but making it the expansion box, it can it can turn an expansion from being a, half the price of a game to being the full price of the original game just based on the box the box alone. Uh, so, 
I think for that reason, it very rarely makes sense to make the expansion box the bigger of the two boxes. Okay, so Jessica says that Dungeon Crawler, 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 Dungeon Crawler Carl is a number one top tier for her in lit RPG. That's the one that I'm reading right now. A few other good ones include He Who Fights with Monsters, Dungeonborn, Azeroth Healer, Defiance of the Fall, Threadbare, and Beware of Chicken. So many of them here, Jessica. There's a pretty wide range of flavors within the genre from dark and violent to sarcastic to rather sweet and cozy. Sweet and cozy, I, say, I would say, is what I'm more often looking for. Um, and I, I, would you say, so I, I recently read, um, oh, what was it? Uh, uh, the, Susanna will know. Susanna, what's the coffee shop or uh, ogre or orc uh, a, a book that we read recently? Um, I'm thinking Bookshops and Bone Dust is the prequel and uh, Legends and Lattes. I think that was the name of it. Uh, that That's kind of in that genre, although it wasn't really RPG, but it was very sweet and cozy and set in a Dungeons and Dragons style world. Really enjoyed that. And I also, it's been a while, but I read a series called um, Off to Be a Wizard or I'm Off to Be a Wizard, something like that. And it felt very similar to this genre and had some neat... Tw uh, kind of justifications about how someone became a wizard in this world. Oh, let's see. Chad says, I see the special edition of Castles of Burgundy is back on GameFound. Sadly, the cheapest version is still 95 with all the minis and stretch goals. Do you think it would have been, it would have been wise to offer a 60 to $70 version without the minis and stretch goals for those just looking for the base game with the new artwork? Probably, yeah. I, I think they... Maybe they didn't do it because they were worried about uh, how much demand there was for that version of the game. People do seem fairly willing to spend ninety five dollars for for a game of this caliber. I mean, it's it's a very very highly ranked game, but and, and maybe they have one. I, I would be surprised if they don't. Do they really not have like a retail version of the game without the minis that that you can just buy from from a store? Or buy that that would seem to make sense at this point with the game. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that is a little bit surprising to me that they don't have that. And maybe they do have something like that in the works planned after the after the game found. A few people have mentioned uh, the, the checklist. Thank you, Heather, for saying that. I think Matt mentioned it earlier as well. Thank you for sharing your publisher checklist. As soon to be first time publisher, that resource is so valuable. Thank you. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. It, it took me a while to go through our checklist and kind of weed out the things that didn't make sense for other publishers, like, like you know, weird, very specific Stonemaier things. But so hopefully the, the list is helpful for you. Hilda says that uh, her husband, Sean, has the I am Knuff shirt for, for Barbie. This is indeed a, a reference to the Barbie movie, which I was saying that I, I, we need to rewatch. I, I, I saw it in the theater. I, I really want to watch it at home with Megan too. Dawson mentions Garp Hill Games as a standout to him in terms of great functional graphic design. And that definitely came up in my chat with, with Julio yesterday, as well as uh, Ian O'Toole came up in a number of these uh, uh, the lists that we talked about yesterday. David says, champions, vote on a game to be added to Rolling Realms. And that's where things get a little tricky with champions, right? Um, I love hearing people's opinions about that sort of thing, but uh, sometimes it can, it can conflict with with certain strategies we have. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I it, That's something, David, I love the idea. I love the idea. That is something we probably won't do, especially since the future of Rolling Realms is probably at this point just Stonemaier games. Because by the time that Rolling Realms Redux comes out this summer, we'll have, I think, around 50 different promos. And that's just, it's a lot. It's a lot of different promos for people to, to seek out or cons even consider. I don't expect anyone to buy all those promos. Um, so we are probably not making new promos for non Stillmeyer games um, in the future. Carlos asked if, if I've watched the show Fallout yet. I, it is on my list. It's at the top of my list to watch, but currently we are watching The Great and we're watching Shogun as our main nighttime viewing, along with, of course, Survivor uh, every week. Um, but I'm really excited to watch Fallout after, after we finish with The Great and Shogun. Uh, the Great, we just finished season one. The Great is about Catherine the Great and uh, and her husband Peter, uh, Emperor Peter in Russia, and uh, Shogun is about uh, uh, post feudal Japan, not not feudal Japan, um, 
maybe postmodern Japan, early 1900s, late 1800s, I think. Merlin's Banner says the ultimate rewatchable movie to him is The Princess Bride. He's watched it so much, I can almost uh, quote the whole movie. I, I, yeah, I, I can see that being on a lot of people's lists. I definitely watched that more than once myself. I need to go, that was one that I probably need to go back and rewatch it to see if it holds up for me without even the nostalgia factor. Because I don't think I saw it as a kid. I saw it as an adult for the first time. Ian has some movies that are on my list as well. Something about Mary, My Cousin Vinny, Lord of the Rings, The Proposal. The Proposal actually really does hold up quite well. We rewatched that last year sometime and still really enjoyed it. Our friend Paul here, Foundations of Rome expansion did a great thing on their Kickstarter. Everything came in a new insert, which replaces a tray in the original box. The new tray holds the old stuff better, plus the new stuff. That's a really clever approach. So Paul, I'm glad you mentioned this, that uh, if you make the original box big enough, you can add different or better organization in the expansion box that transfers over to the original box. We did this uh, in Between Two Castles. So in Between Two Castles, we left room just in case. We didn't know that we were going to do expansion, but we left room for an extra insert to be added to the game if we did an expansion. And so when you get the expansion for Between Two Castles, you just take the insert out of the box and you put it into the core game box. You can recycle the the, the expansion box and you're good to go. Everything there is, is in the box that you need. Um, Adam says the bridge disaster in Baltimore a few weeks ago, really tragic uh, disaster in terms of uh, human life and um, and infrastructure. Uh, got Adam thinking, do you ship all Stelmeyer games on container ships like this? And if so, do you have contingency plans if a delay like this ever happens during a major game launch? I have a couple a great question here and a couple answers to it. One is uh, we do ship everything. Yeah, we make everything in Shenzhen, China, or pretty much everything over there. And so we have to then ship it to four different fulfillment centers around the world. And things happen sometimes on the way to those containers. Uh, oftentimes it's just a delay, but um, sometimes it can be even worse than that. Like, for example, with the Houthi attacks in the Red Sea recently, a number of freight shipping containers, instead of going from China through the Red Sea up through the Mediterranean to uh, the UK, where we have our fulfillment center in, in Europe, they had to go all the way around Africa. They were rerouted all around Africa. So that added quite a bit of shipping time. It also adds to shipping costs because it means those containers take longer to get back to China, um, adding to the cost. It has a huge impact on supply and demand when something like that happens. Same with Baltimore. We don't ship through Baltimore, um, but uh, but anything could happen to another port elsewhere where we are shipping our products. So, and here's the the I, I guess the the big overall answer for what happens is this is one of the number one reasons why we don't sell something until we actually have it in stock, or we try not to do that. It's we do. There are times where we do it, but it's very very rare that we try not to sell something until we have actually received it or had it in our stock. Per Carlos's question earlier, had it in stock for at least a few weeks at each of at all of our fulfillment centers because those delays can happen. And uh, by doing it that way, by waiting until the products in stock to actually launch it, then there really isn't a delay, uh, at least not a, con a consumer focused delay, um, because we're still. Uh, we, the delay is on our end. We are we are just waiting for it to launch the product until it actually arrives at our fulfillment centers, uh, rather than the other way around. Accepting someone's money in advance and then having putting the delays on them um, for the foreseeable future. So, yeah, that's a great question, and I think that is a major justification for why we don't launch products until we've already made them and we already have them in stock at our fulfillment centers because things like this happen. So that is our plan. Our contingency plan is is waiting to launch until we've actually received the product. Yeah. Julio says, I missed the question of the day and chocolate of the day too. Uh, you know, I didn't really do a question of the day. I kind of asked like, what do you think is the most rewatchable movie? Um, but I don't have another real question of the day related to Stomeyer games or, or anything like that today. So that was just the question of the day. Chocolate of the day. I, I mentioned very early on in the podcast that we're a little under the weather in our house today. So, um, Maybe we'll have some chocolate, but really we're just trying to eat a lot of vitamin C and um, maybe some soup. That'll be our that'll be our indulgence of the day today. And Susanna did remember that the book is Legends and Lattes. And Jessica said, confirms that uh, if sweet and cozy is my flavor, and not always my flavor, but sometimes, um, and I really, really enjoyed Legends and Lattes. I'd love to have more fiction like that. 
So if you, Jessica, if you have any other recommendations similar to that, let me know as well. Dawson is loving the Fallout series as well. Chad it reread Dark Matter in preparation for the show. There was a show based on a book that Chad really liked and that I liked as well, that Chad recommended. He says, I know you don't reread many books, but do you ever do so to prepare for an upcoming show or movie? I would actually say I do the opposite. I try to not remember as much from uh, the, the, the book so that the show or movie can be really fresh for me. Um, I don't have a great memory in general, so it's fairly easy for me to forget the, the small details in the book. Uh, so, but, but yeah, definitely I, I avoid reading it, uh, leading up to the, the release of a movie or a show based on a book that I love. Ray says, I just rewatched a movie for the first time that I suspect will be pretty rewatchable. Have you seen The Holdovers? Uh, you know, I don't think I have seen The Holdovers. No. Uh, he says, I was quite impressed with the point tone it managed to achieve. Although it's a Christmas movie, still good even now. I think it'll be a very easy one to, re to return to each Christmas or two. I have not seen The Holdovers. I, I can picture a few of the, uh, I can picture like the aesthetic of it in my head, but I, I have not seen it. So I'll have to put that on my list to try out. Garrett mentioned that uh, last week he was going to try Disney animated and he says they finally played it and it was great. You asked if it was a shared or a separate action tableau. It's shared, but you start with one unique ability and eventually gain more. Uh, so a little bit like um, what I love about the Guild of Merchant Explorers tied with the action system in Arc Nova. I, I'm very curious about it, Garrett. I, I, I'm glad you enjoyed it. And I look forward to trying it at some point, maybe at uh, a Geekway. I'll add that to my Geekway list, in fact. So Geekway to the West is coming up in a few weeks here in St. Louis, about, about one month from now. And I've been compiling the games that I want to actually play there. Oh, I'll just put it on my uh, Disney Animated. I'll do that. I'll add it to my list later. Alvin says he has a friend that lives in San Antonio, and he was telling me about the difference in game prices. South Africa, I think is what you're saying. Maybe South America? A lot of different things for SA, what SA could be. A uh, $120 game here in the States is upwards of $430 there. Distribution is a nightmare in a lot of places. And if you're talking about South America in particular, there are a number of countries there that have really, really high import taxes, like 90% import taxes. So a product immediately doubles in price just based on the import cost alone. Yeah. Jessica says, uh, the Wizards 2.0 series off to be the Wizard is super. Yes, great. Uh, it's a great series. I think I got through like four or five books of it um, and really, really enjoyed it. Off to be the Wizard. Martin mentioned it too. He says, what did you think of the book? Was it a good read? I really liked his comics, but didn't try his books yet. I enjoyed that. I didn't actually know there were comics of it, but I really enjoyed at least a few of the novels. There was something that happened like four or five books in where I checked out after that. I can't remember what it was, but I enjoyed it up until that point. Let's see. Oh, George, very kind to ask about my elbow. So, George, I you missed this earlier in the podcast or in the live cast, but I was playing disc golf this past weekend in Kansas City, and I was throwing backhand. I was doing backhand drives, which I haven't done in a couple of years now because uh, my elbow is hurting a little bit. And so I, even though I'm not very good at backhand drives, I, I was like, you know, I, I want to play some disc golf at these courses. I'll play anyway. And I got an ace somehow. It completely blew my mind that I got an ace throwing backhand because I really have not, I've not thrown backhand drives in nearly two years now. I've only thrown forehand drives. Um, but given my elbows, the extra time off is really helping. I did buy a brace that I'm going to start wearing at night to maybe help out. And, um, and I got an armband that people recommended last week that, uh, that I'm, that I'm going to try out in the near future. So hopefully that will, will help the problem and just rest really seems to have be helping the, the elbow. Susanna is excited that Merlin's Bride mentioned Merlin's Manor mentioned Princess Bride. She says, absolutely the best rewatchable movie. Julio says, oh, so Julio says, one thing that I think would have been a good thing to bring up during the video yesterday is the correlation of the games we picked up and if they're in the top 100. Yeah, that's interesting. Of the games we mentioned, I'm trying to think of which ones. A few of them are in the top 100. A few of them aren't, though. Um, but yeah, one of the things that Julio and I commented on in a video that we filmed yesterday that will come out later about graphic design is that graphic design can really make or break a game. And so I'm guessing that most of the games in the BGG top 100 have at, at the very basic level, decent graphic design and probably have really, really good graphic design in those games as well. Melissa says she really loved the uh, TV series, The Great, which we're watching right now. 
Um, Nick is one of my favorite actors. He does a great job as as Peter in this in the series. Luke says, "Why not a series of dungeon crawl rolling realms?" There, are, well, there kind of is that. If you play the solo campaign of Rolling Realms, there is a, a little bit of that uh, series of of kind of moving through a series of um, of challenges. If you play the the solo, uh, the putt putt version of it. Derek mentions a movie called The Burbs, the color as as his favorite rewatchable movie. Uh, Chad says the original Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie still holds up and is his all-time favorite movie. I haven't watched that one in a long, long time. Uh, let's see. Oh, no. Melissa says her gaming group all but moved away and her cats I think me trying to solo game means they should help. <laughs> That's adorable that they're trying to join your gaming group, Melissa. I'm sorry your whole group moved away, though. That's really unfortunate. I see some other, let's see, Lord of the Rings, Princess Bride. Uh, oh, David says that he got his April Fool's chocolate from Stomar Games and he found it very tasty. I'm glad to hear that, David. Glad to hear you enjoyed it. Um, let's see, Ian says, not sure if this is actually news or not, but I just saw on Facebook that the Wizards of the Coast president is stepping down at the end of the month. Interesting. Um, yeah, I, I, I wasn't aware of that. What are the other topics I had today? Actually, that's about it. I did. So I, I posed a question to Stonemaier ambassadors earlier this week about AI. I, I, I asked two questions. I wanted to see what they were thinking and feeling about AI. And I, I'm going to do a blog post about this tomorrow. So um, specifically uh, generative AI, AI that is creating something or is pretending to create something using things that other people have already created. Um, and uh, our stance at Stonemaier Games is that we do not use generative AI. We don't use AI to write content. We don't use AI to uh, create images or edit content. Uh, we don't use generative AI. Uh, but I did mention in the survey that the one area where I would be, where, where I'm open to using AI, if it gets this to the point in the future where we can use it for this, is to um, kind of blunt force play test a game. Not to replace human play testers, but to, uh, for for balancing issues, to take a game, especially a game with asymmetry, and if you could just run the rule book through an AI system and have that AI play the game a thousand times in the next five minutes and give you a balance report, I would be interested in that. I mean, that's something that that I think would be very difficult to replicate on a human level um, that that a computer could potentially do. That is the one area where I'm curious about any form of generative AI at all. But other than that, we at some of our games, we we don't use it. We have no plans of using generative AI of any sort. Uh, not for not for art, not for text, not for um, not for video, audio, anything like that. Um, but I wanted to gauge what some of our ambassadors are thinking about it too. So I I pulled them about it, and you'll see those polls in tomorrow's uh, blog post if you want to check that out. Of course, if you have any opinions here that you want me to share, anything that you think I should discuss in that article, let me know today uh, in the livecast. Ian mentions Elf as a very rewatchable re movie. I totally agree about that. I haven't seen Elf in a while. I think maybe Megan overwatched it in earlier days and doesn't have much interest in returning to it. But I did really enjoy watching Elf multiple times. Eric says, did Walter take credit for the ace given it was with a Stillmeyer kitten disc? You know, Eric, I should have taken a photo with Walter when I got back with the ace disc. Because it was, as Eric mentions here, it was a Stillmeyer kitten disc. My first ace was the Stonemaier disc, I think, and it was the kitten disc, which has Walter on one half and my beloved Biddy also on the upper half of the disc. Or maybe maybe I've reversed those two. But it was extra special for me to get that ace with not just the Stonemaier disc, but that disc in particular. And yeah, I think Walter gets credit for the ace too, as does Megan, because she was my doubles partner when we were playing. Chad, I've heard this from several people. Chad mentions that the Dungeon Crawler Carl book that I'm reading right now, uh, the audio version is really, really good. And uh, I'm, I'll have to see if I can find the, the audio version of it. Um, yeah, I'll have to, thank you for Chad for mentioning that. I'll, I'll look on, I've been listening to audiobooks on Spotify if they're included in my Spotify subscription. So I'll see if that's, if, if that's on Spotify. 
I'm, I feel like I missed a comment there, but maybe I didn't. Uh, oh, hey, Steve says, you have me interested in disc golf the past few live casts. I saw people playing at a park in Wentzville, Missouri. It looked fun, but they all had backpacks filled. Realistically, how many discs are needed? If you're just starting out, you could play with as few as two discs. I'd probably go with three. Uh, I would go with, uh, and you can see this, like, you can get like basic starter packs on Amazon. Um, they're not often the nicest disc. And you don't really have to have the nicest disc, but you need to have like somewhat halfway decent disc. You can get them from the Stonemaier Games web store if you want. But I have one driver, one mid-range disc, and one putter. With those three, you can play disc golf and have fun for quite a while until you start to see how different types of discs turn in different ways. Um, but starting out, that's uh, that's pretty much all you need. You can go on our website and get maybe a kitten disc, a scythe disc, and either a kitten or a wingspan. Kitten or a wingspan disc, a scythe disc, and uh, I like the green gully putty that, putter that we have on our website. Or web store. So Jordan says, I think generative AI could play an interesting role in playtesting and game balancing, not as a replacement, but as a supplement. And that is the one area that I'm that I'm open to it. Um, if uh, if it if it's easy to use, like that's the thing with AI, and maybe that's the whole point of AI that I I, I don't want to have to program the system to know how to do it because we already have that for games, like with uh, with Wingspan. You, Wingspan Digital has AI that you can play against the AI if you want. Um, they could probably even program the AI to play against the AI in a game of Wingspan Digital. Um, but that took quite a, get a, quite a lot of programming to get there. So for an AI to just be able to learn a game from the rulebook and then be able to play test it without you doing anything else, just feeding it the files would be, uh, would be that would be the level at which I would consider using it for, for uh, blunt force play testing. And then Ray has a good point here. Can you program in human error? Because humans are going to make mistakes when we play games. We all make mistakes when we play games. You would get a particular optimized form of play. So it might be valuable for that. Um, could be helpful, quite helpful if small designers could use it too. Yeah, if anyone, yeah, I agree. If, if anyone could use this, it would be great. As long as it doesn't replace the human play testing. Like I, I agree, build in some human error in there too. But the best form of human error you're going to learn from play testing with, with humans. Uh, Matt says, uh, so Matt has been using AI art for prototypes, but uh, but he's not going to use it for the final product. Um, and that is a good area that I probably need to explore in the post about um, whether or not to use it for prototyping. We don't use it for prototyping, but every now and then we use placeholder art, just grab from like Google images from prototyping. So where do you draw the line there? Um, so I'll make a note about that. Because really for prototyping, I, I don't recommend that anyone commissions art for prototyping. So much can change from, from the prototy prototyping process. Melissa says that for ALF fans, there are holiday specials. I do think a far out fourth is available on, for stream on Amazon. Uh, Jeremy says, have you read the Xanth, Xanth series by Piers Anthony or Magic Kingdom for Sale by Terry Brooks? I have not read either of those, um, but they sound like they would be up my alley. What is, uh, what's the hook of Xanth by Piers Anthony, the author of whom I recognize? I've read a few of his books, but not Xanth specifically. Zachary says, what kind of gaming table do you have? Are there any major pros or cons you've experienced with it? I'm really happy with my gaming table. I have a Jasper gaming table from formerly boardgametables.com, now all play. And it is, I don't know the size of the table. I think maybe four by six, maybe a little bit bigger. And it's the type that has uh, an inset. And particularly with the inset, it has three different pieces that you pull off to expose the inset. Uh, with my previous table, I think there were, there's only one piece, maybe two pieces. They were really heavy, but pulling off three pieces is very easy. I really like that. It has cup holders that can slide in on the sides. Um, sometimes we bump the, t the cup holders. They aren't, they aren't wonderful, but they, they get the job done pretty well. I don't have many hangups about it at all. I guess one little thing that could have been added is if a groove had been cut in the, in the outer rim so that you could have, uh, it could double as a card holder. I would enjoy that because I like having card holders in games, but overall, I think it was a great, um, I'm, I'm really happy with it. it it's held up over the years. I, I, I I, I could have replaced it at any time over the last, I don't know, six, seven years, but I haven't because it really has held up well. 
and it was transported. We, we, I moved it from, from one condo to another. Um, so yeah, the Jasper gaming table, I don't know if they still sell it, but it was, a, I thought it was a great deal. I'm seeing some other comments about, uh, AI as well. And, um, let's see. Yeah. Alvin says, I think the only current use for AI in this field is to generate prototyping images for designers to get the feel they want to portray to the publishers, which I think I'm fine with that. I'm fine with the designer coming to me and, and saying, here's what I'm hoping the art will look like, whether it's a generated image or an image that they've uh, pulled off, pulled offline somewhere. Um, Derek says, if any designer wants to make an indie card game with the, with requiring so many pieces of art, should they just not make the game if they can't get the money to pay for the art? That's an interesting question. I, I think there are different types of art that you can commission from human artists uh, that cost different amounts of money. So if you have a game that has 300 illustrations and your budget is really just for 100 illustrations, you could change that art from like full color, foreground, foreground and unique backgrounds to no background and a, a simpler illustrations with just like a splash of color for the foreground. So there are ways to work around that and to find artists who have different budgets. There are artists that definitely charge a thousand dollars per piece, but there are also artists that maybe are breaking their way into the industry and they, uh, maybe they're faster. They can work a little bit faster and they, they charge $50 per illustration. So, um, I think it is possible to find the right artist for pretty much any game at the right cost. Niels says, uh, just tried Wormspan with his wife and we love it. I'm happy to hear that, Niels. But are there plans for a Wingspan crossover kit? In short, we would love a Wingspan with a Wormspan me mechanisms. Because I appreciate you saying that, but, but they are two very different games in the way the, the many different mechanisms in the games work. Um, there are different resources in Wormspan. You're moving left to right, which doesn't seem like a big deal, but it is a big deal on how it operates. Um, so no, we, we don't plan on putting dragons in Wingspan or birds in, in Wormspan. They'll, they'll just be independent games, but I'm glad you are enjoying Wormspan. That's what's most important. Um, let's see, uh, Benjamin says, are there any plans to restamp any of the discs you've got? I really like the bliss disc you've got, but I think the other ones have a lot of potential. I don't think we're going to restamp any of them, Benjamin. I, we have, uh, we started out with with using just kind of basic graphic design on the disc and then i started commissioning art from my friend miles who did the art for or part of some of the art for red rising and he's done some special things so i don't think we'll go back and restamp any of the any of the older ones but we are working with miles going forward on the newer discs for amazing stamps like the one on the bliss disc and we have some cool ones in the works that i, I think you'll you'll be excited to see in fact i need to check with him about another game I'll make a note about that. Okay, so Jeremy says that so he recommended the book Xanth from Piers Anthony. The catch with the Xanth is everything is literal. A buttercup flower is a cup filled with butter. Oh, that's interesting. Kind of a playful, playful tone to it. I like that. And Melissa says her friend who moved away message to say how much she liked worm span she'll have to try it someday it does come with a solo mode if you and your cats want to try to play it melissa uh worm span does um yeah but I, i'm sorry I, I feel your loss that your that your game group moved away garrett says are there, are there any upcoming discs up for grabs for whose signature disc it is uh there are yeah there there are I, our group in st louis has continued to grow and so there are some people that i'll probably go to first for it but i'm open to to adding other names to the, those discs, especially if you're someone who's gotten the disc off through Stillmeyer Games in a way, um, maybe we'll, you'll have to let me know and maybe we can consider, consider you for a, a, a stamped disc someday. Garrett, do you wanna hold, throw your throw your name in the hat for that one? Um, yeah, thank you all. You, you, great food for thought for today. I, I've taken a number of notes of things that I need to do, reminders for my to-do list, thanks to today's conversation. Thanks for your contributions to the, the conversation about most rewatchable movies, AI and games, or yeah, AI and games in particular, and AI in general. And uh, I'll be covering that topic tomorrow on the blog if everything goes as planned. I hope you all have a great rest of the day, a great week, and I will see you next Wednesday for a special announcement. I'll see you then. Take care.